Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining. We're going to give everyone a couple more minutes to sign on, and then we will get started with our presentation. In the meantime, if you want to send us a chat from where you're dialing in from, we'd love to hear from you. Here they come flooding in. <laughs> All right. Hi, everybody. We're just waiting for people to get joined into the webinar, get ready to get started. Uh, while we're sitting around waiting, join us in the chat. Let us know from where you are dialing in. No dangling participles there. We'd love to. We'd love to see where where you might be at. Oh, there it is. That I, I got it that time. Uh oh, chat's disabled. Somehow I had a feeling. Thanks for letting us know. We'll get our best people on it. All right, for those just joining, we're trying to get the chat enabled. Uh, we're waiting for a majority of the people to join uh, when we get the chat enabled. We'd love to hear where you're dialing in from. Uh, and we'll get started probably right at uh, five after the hour, maybe a little earlier. We'll see what happens. Okay, let's try this again. I think chat is enabled for everyone. You can't get into chat. Let us know in the Q&A. Hey, yeah. there we go. <laughs> Winning. Yay. Kansas, all right. New Hampshire, California, Colorado over here. Lake? Oh, yeah. I'm Lenexa, Kansas. I can type that. Oh, let's see. Wait, you're also in Lenexa, Kansas? I am today. I am in the office today. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Missouri. All right. Hopefully, hopefully all of our Midwest USA folks are having a wind, severe wind free day that would be great yeah man that's been like back to back for a while yeah san antonio texas down by the river walk probably not at the river walk but maybe like that would be pretty sweet westy as westy colorado i feel like that means westminster but i could be wrong Ann Arbor, Orlando. Orlando. Yes. Home of Mickey Mouse. Favorite. Whoa, boring suburb shots fired. 
<laughs> Scottsdale, my unofficial home. New York City. Love it. Love. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Uh, if you just joined, we're putting where we're dialing in from into the chat. Uh, we got a lot of kind of middle and southern America covered. We're hoping and uh, northeast. See if we can get some Pacific Northwest in here. Got some California. All right, Alexa, take us out in one minute. You got it. One minute. JD, I need to know where your favorite restaurant is in Scottsdale. I have a favorite pizza place. In Scottsdale? Uh-huh. Uh, I guess it's outside of Scottsdale, Bianco. Okay. Yeah, Pizzeria Bianco. Mm -hmm. Fogo de Chow. Okay. Meats on sticks. <laughs> All right. Shall we go? Yep. Okay. Well, good morning. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for dialing into today's webinar, Providing Armor, Constructing a Secure Application Security Foundation, or as we also like to refer to it as making friends and influencing people. My name is Alexa Sevilla and I'm the Senior Director of Product Marketing here at Stackhawk. And I'm so excited for this presentation. Um, but first, a few housekeeping items before we begin. The webinar is being recorded and we will send out a copy of the recording and slides post webinar. Please post your questions in the Q&A or Q&A uh, or chat functions on Zoom. We love these to be super interactive and engaging. So um, we'll be checking those and, and responding. Um, we do have a couple polls that will be popping up. So please uh, participate in those. And with that, I'd like to introduce our speakers, Lake Setzer, Information Security Lead at Community America Credit Union, and Scott Gerlach, co uh, CSO and co-founder at Stackhawk. Lake, the floor is yours. All right. And like Alexa said, my name is Lake Setzer. I'm an Information Security Lead here at Community, Community America Credit Union. Um, I've been passionate information security professional for roughly seven years since I graduated college and a little before during my internship, um, previous roles, um, current holder of the SANS GX GPYC. I have a BS in cybersecurity and I'm actively pursuing some, um, I think pretty awesome certs and going for the CISSP, OSCP and OSWA right now. Um, and outside of work, I'm a devoted dad and husband, and I love riding dirt bikes with my friends. So, uh, Scott, you know, take it away from there. Yeah, what's the dirt bike noise for all the dirt bikers out there? Uh, brap. Brap. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Alexa. Thanks, Lake. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Scott Gerlach, uh, CSO co-founder at Stackhawk. Um, half of this gray in my beard versus the picture on the screen. Uh, that's all Stackhawk, so that's good. <laughs> probably just age, but you know, whatever. Uh, I was a CISO at SendGrid for about three years. Uh, and I held a, a lot of different roles at GoDaddy before that. Uh, the last role I had was senior security architect there. I also, uh, husband, dad, golfer, home Kubernetes admin, which I like to refer to as uh, husband job security. Uh, cause if it all goes, if it all breaks, Hey, um, I'm also a newly inducted member of the Hole in One Club, which I'm very proud of. Uh, I'm probably two or three weeks away from playing on the PGA Tour at this point. That's a joke. I was very lucky, which was exciting. Uh, if you want to get a hold of me after this, you can find me on Twitter at that Twitter handle or on LinkedIn in that particular uh, URL. All right. So today, Lake, you're going to take us through. I'm going to help you get through it. Some right. of the things you've been doing at Community America Credit Union. Uh, but I think everyone needs to know, uh, what is that? 
Yeah, for sure. Yeah, so what is Community America Credit Union, right? Um, we are a member-focused credit union. Uh, we love giving back to our members. Uh, as you can see, we do profit payouts every year, and statistically, those numbers continue to go up. As we get more members, we're able to pay out more profits to our members. Um, you know, we were established in 1940. We are the exclusive banking partners for the Chiefs. Um, and the KC Comets, which is an awesome indoor soccer team, and the Mavericks, which is a professional hockey team here in Kansas City. And we're also um, exclusive partners with uh, Kansas City Royals as well. So we're local. Um, we just, you know, we love helping our members, and you know, we're we're counting. We're going awesome. up. So can can anyone outside of Kansas become a member? Um, not, uh, you know, there are definite ways you can become a member if you work here. Um, but it's generally, our credit unions have a area of operation. So, um, just check them. Look at yeah. all this return on investments. Yeah, so. Right. Yeah, for sure. Um, <clears throat> we are, we are currently expanding into St. Louis right now. We have some St. Louis branches and we're working on an awesome deal with the Cardinals right now. So. Um, but it is usually geographically locked and there are some other, um, other criteria, but if you work for us, you're, you can automatically be a member. I think there's a couple other stipulations, but I can't think of them off the top of my head. Are you guys yeah. currently hiring? If the only way to become a member is work <laughs> there, are you guys currently hiring? Uh, yeah, we're, we're, we're always hiring. All right. uh, there's, there's job postings all over LinkedIn for various Great. positions. All right. Uh, so we're talking a little bit about what you've been working on um, at Community America Credit Union. Uh, you want to give us a little overview? Yeah, for sure. Um, so this kind of takes us back to early 2021. Um, our brilliant CIO came down and said, hey, we're going to start developing our own applications instead of purchasing and, you know, doing what, you know, normal banks do, which is, you know, I'm going to pay for my application to be made from some third party vendor. They're going to provide updates. You know, what's typically what, what most credit unions and banks do. And our CIS said, well, we're going to do it differently. And, you know, what comes with that is, well, we got to secure our code. We got to understand, you know, there are some risks with that, but, you know, we're going to tackle those risks as they come. <clears throat> And um, <laughs> no yeah. cheating. No, don't read ahead. I mean, you can. <laughs> you can, yeah. Um, so with that, uh, we were like, okay, well, we got to launch an AppSec program like ASAP. And that's when I got hired to be the AppSec guy, right? And so I come on and, you know, I've done a little AppSec, you know, dabbled in it, you know, back at DST, which is now SSNC, SSNC Technologies. Um, and I was like, well, I know, I know how to use this one vendor that definitely verifies your code. And um, <laughs> uh, I was like, well, we'll implement that and we'll, we'll do some POCs. And what you're looking at here is our um, POC data. We went with a couple of different vendors. And I guess what I'm trying to point out with Sneak is we are definitely a Sneak customer now, but I wasn't really seeing the vision whenever we first, you know, looked at Sneak. You know, I wasn't, I wasn't the center of control. I wasn't the the main guy so as you can see looking at some of these pros and cons we i definitely wanted to be in control i wanted to be the center of the universe when it came to appsec because i was the appsec guy that's what i was hired to do right um so we we're just navigating new waters and you know this is kind of the start of our journey um we made a decision a business decision to develop our internal application, our own internal applications and external applications. So what comes with that is starting an app, application security program. So like, talk, talk to me a little bit about um, kind of the experience you had with AppSec tools previously, how that sort of influenced uh, what you were, well, how you started here at Community America and then some of the un what you might know now as unknowns about how those tools might operate at Community America. 
Yeah, for sure. Um, experience with other tools, they were definitely, you know, point and clicky, like, hey, I'm going to type in this domain and go scan this domain, right? Mm -hmm. You just go, go scan it. Let's, um, let's get, give me a vulnerability list that I can pass off to somebody to have them fix. You know, that was basically my extent of, you know, knowledge with how AppSec worked was I came from a very traditional um, background where, you know, we had very big applications and they were, you're more traditional, you're more traditional apps that actually worked really well with. Um, when you start getting into APIs, I guess this is the more, more unknown portion kind of going into, you start getting into APIs, you can start getting APIs, your single page applications, all of that kind of starts to not work as well, right? Because if I have microservices, you know, there's tons of different URLs that I could be hitting at once. It's not just one big domain. Okay, let's go hit it. Different applications can be used in different portions of all of the microservices, right? So, and on top of that, um, our static analysis, same thing. It was, I'm going to connect it to this repo and I'm going to hit go every time I need to scan it. So that, that was generally my frame of mind coming into building this AppSec program was, you know, I, I need to be the center of the universe, clicking things, let, let's go. Okay, cool. All right, so talk about some of the positives and some of the negatives that yeah. went along with that. And then also, like, I don't know where your mic is on your thing, but it's rubbing like on your what? shirt. Oh. Is that better? I, I could hold it. Yeah, that's cool. Okay. It was just making a little scratchy noise. So okay. Sorry about that. Yeah, no worries. Um, so yeah, positives, you know, we definitely achieved regulatory regulatory compliance. Um, we were definitely scanning our code. It just wasn't um <clears throat> wasn't being done, wasn't being done that well. And you know, if they scratched an inch a little bit inch deeper, it may have not been us passing audit. Now we definitely are, no matter how how deep they scratch, you know. But then it was, you know, we were we were doing it, but you know, it's all, you know, with learning comes failure. That's what this did. It failed fast and we instantly sought different vendors. Mm -hmm. Um <clears throat> You know, and through that, we definitely established a partner with a third party um, company. Um, Trust Foundry is a great partner for us that does a lot of our red teaming. Um, so that was a huge positive coming out from that is that we established a great partnership with Trust Foundry. Um, and then, you know, uh, our security, our maturity was kind of unveiled at that point. So we had a we had a baseline of where we were at and a new vision on where we needed to kind of shoot, shoot um, in the future. Um, you know, negatives, obviously, are that this legacy vendors pricing model didn't really match up to what we needed, right? They wanted to charge per application. Um, that per application charge, you start getting into microservices and you have a hundred different microservices, you know, doesn't really uh it doesn't really line up right sure so, um so that microservice architecture was a huge hindrance and another huge hindrance was uh capabilities within our cicd pipeline um a lot of these uh, so i guess i want to call them traditional vendors uh, i don't know what else to call them <laughs> um was that would be whenever they come in they try to scan your code they're using an external scanner but that external scanner you could be waiting X amount of unknown period, um, X amount of unknown time because someone else is using the scanner or there's limited number as a scanner. So it definitely increases your time to scan. And then the time it takes to then scan the product going through different firewalls, obviously you should whitelist it. But if you didn't, you know, there's obviously things that can go wrong going over the internet and hitting to your, your applications. Um, so that was another another big issue. <clears throat> um, and then the actual vendor couldn't scan our, couldn't SAS scan the, the microservice framework we were using. So that was a huge red flag. 
Uh, it just wasn't returning vulnerabilities. So, um, so that was because of like a, a language or framework problem. Yeah, yeah, they didn't know how to read like the sinks and sanitizers of the framework, so I didn't really know how to unlock the car, and so that was a big, a big factor playing into what SAS scanner we were going to use. Okay, cool. Uh, so we got a poll up. Thank you everyone for answering, or the, all the people that did answer. Let's see, twenty five answers, forty seven attendees. Uh, we would love it if you'd answer our poll. We've got a what frustrates you about your AppSec program today poll question up there. We'd love to hear from all 47 of you. Um, today looks like the leader in the in the poll so far is I can't get buy-in from engineering. Thanks for coming to the webinar. That's exactly what we're talking about today. <laughs> uh, we're going to talk about a little bit of tools, uh, a little bit of how, all that good stuff. But the thing uh, we're going to focus on with Lake here uh, is how he got buy-in, the work that he did around that. Um, anything else on this? Thank you, everyone, for answering the poll question. Uh, if you do have questions for Lake uh, about how he influenced or you know tools that he's using, why he's using them, all that good stuff, please include them in the webinar chat or in the Q&A. Uh, Franz, I think you asked a very specific product question. If it's okay, we'll follow up with you after the webinar about that. Um, but I want, I want to make sure that Lake's got time to talk about what's working in his environment, what challenges he had to overcome, some of the things that were wrong with some of the tools that he picked and how he influenced the rest of the organization as well. Okay. Perfect. So... All right, so this was definitely where we started to go into that shift left mindset. You know, I realized that this failed and it was partly because I just didn't know enough. Um, and so what we needed, we, what we desperately needed process wise was faster scan times, accurate scans. Like I, I needed accurate scans, faster scans and the ability to simultaneously scan. So if one of my engineers is working on one part of a code repository and another is working on this, you know, the same, uh, just a different portion of that functionality, they both need to be able to scan at the same time. So I'm not slowing down their pipelines, their development pipelines. Um, and our licensing model needed to shift more towards a developer North Star model to where my developers are being licensed rather than licensing per applications because that licensing model like we're 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 a smaller development shop here and you know where we spend our money really matters and so that was super crucial for us it's like we're as this cost grows it's going to be because we're getting bigger you know not because we've developed a hundred different microservices that could have anywhere from 10 to 50 lines of code in them right um so, um, and then, you know, we needed more partnership throughout the organization and how we were going to try to do that was, is promoting security champions and building a foundation inside of our, our DevOps pipeline or SDLC. Yeah. So talk a little bit more about partnership throughout the organization. What, how did you figure out what teams needed to be, uh, involved, what teams were there, um, how, how did that, how did that process start? You know, where, where did it struggle and what were some tips and tricks? If you got any to like help people get over that same problem in their own organization. Yeah, for sure. Um, where it really started was with my boss, me and her kind of sat down into a room and I was like, Hey, this is, this is not going good. And this is obviously my fault, right? Like I signed us up for this. This was this was my decision. Like it needs to change. This is my, my failure. Like I need to kind of shove my ego to the side a little bit. And I was like, I need to hear what our development, our development teams want. I need to hear what their leaders want, what their problems are. I need to understand their problems because their problems become my problems later on. Right. Um, long development time, like long development pipelines, you know, all of this whole list here, came from meeting with those leaders 
uh, and we kind of looked at you know where most of the, the 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 development at that time was happening, and that was in our EIP team, which is our enterprise integration platforms. Some people might call them platforms teams, um, and our digital team, which is our um, member facing like front side like make everything look fancy for our members, uh, our front end developers, and our DevOps team. Were, were the teams that were making the most code. So we were looking around and we were like, okay, those are the, those are the teams I need to get the most buy-in from because they're contributing most to what's going on. So I need to understand what they're doing and how I can solve their problems. And then, I, and then, and then from there, I solve my own problems, right? Yeah. They're gonna want to use my tools. They're gonna want to do this if I can oh. solve their problems. How much time would you say you spent talking to those teams you identified to, yeah. to really understand what, how they do work and how you can fit into that? Yeah, this wasn't like an overnight thing. This took, I know this failed pretty fast into 21. And I, we didn't, you know, we, it took a majority of 2022 to get to understand what everybody needed and to get everybody have the time to get everybody involved in POCs, demos, all of that. That wasn't just me attending the demos. It wasn't just me attending the, doing the POCs. It was all of my developers and their leaders attending to make sure these tools were exactly what they wanted out of, gotcha. out of a scanning platform. So it took a, the better half of a year. So we spent the, almost the entire 2022 year understanding what was critically needed to change what where we messed up on so that was that was probably the the most time spent was meeting with people and understanding their needs yeah yeah uh what forms of bribery did that take <laughs> you know lunches pizzas mm, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. awesome so spend a little money get a little return is yeah right like a piece of that um Grace has a question for us. Uh, she would like to know, he, she, he, they, they would like to know uh, the type scale size. We're talking about how many apps and repos uh, are you dealing with? And then I think the other thing to go along with that is how many developers and how many AppSec pros? Yeah, good, good questions. Um, so we have, oh, <clears throat> We have lots of repos because we have a lot of microservices, but if you were to like control them into like, um, you know, a team, you know, there was probably, probably like five major teams that do development. And we have about 50 developers and, you know, I'm, I'm the main point of contact for AppSec. So you got like your main, your one main guy. Okay. So tens or hundreds of repos? Uh, if you wanted to count the like individual microservices, it's probably closer in the, in the hundreds. Hundreds. Okay. So um, I'm going to guess to answer the next question, uh, poly repo, not mono repo. Yeah. Many, many repos, not one single repo. Um, and then 50 developers to one lake. Yep. Which is a pretty good ratio. Uh, I think the well-known ratio in security land is one security person per 50 developers. I think that's a little generous. Uh, Lake is skewing this number by all by himself. Uh, <laughs> I think it's more like one to 150, 200 in most organizations. Um, but this is, that's all good, good uh, information to know. Let's see. Da -da 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 -da. Culture is important. Culture is important. And that is what we are talking about. All right, cool. So we have... Uh, the next slide here, Lake was just talking about um, naturally his own maturity. And we have at Stackhawk have been talking to hundreds and hundreds of customers and prospects and talking through this kind of maturity thing as well. And we've come up with this, uh, I think it's pretty neat, maturity model or kind of what we refer to as the AppSec shift left maturity model or the continuous security maturity model, whatever you want to call it. Uh, so, and this is also a, a nice little piece of information you're going to get from attending the webinar. So thanks for being here. Um, but I guess the important thing is 
<clears throat> as we've been talking to the, these customers, a, a lot of themes are coming out, like a lot of similar patterns. Everyone's a little bit different, but a similar pattern is hap happening all the time. Um, Lake, where do you, I think we also have a poll question going on here, but like when you're taking a look at this, just kind of out, out of the box, where do you think your community America was on this um, maturity model? And how, how quickly do you think you identified it? Yeah. Um, when we started in 21, we were definitely in number one. Uh, we were in that that third bullet of we kind of wanted to shift left, but we didn't. We weren't really interested in giving up central control. That's ex that's exactly where I was. Um, I think I even said it at the beginning of the webinar. Here was I. I wanted to be the center of attention. Mm -hmm. Look at me, I'm the app set guy, right? <clears throat> um, so that's definitely where we were, and it failed so fast that I had to recognize it pretty quickly going into 22. Um, so it was like beginning of 21, about March timeframe. Um, it failed pretty quickly and we started looking for new tooling in 22, the following year. So okay. probably about January, February, 22. So, you know, nine months, 10 months. Yep. And so we were talking about your audit process. You were talking about your audit process a little bit earlier, which is where a lot of our stage one um, people might live, where they're trying to satisfy audits. And you were talking to me about some of the challenges or the frustrations you were having uh, when you were in audits um, and kind of, kind of hoping for different outcomes from audits. Can you yeah. talk, talk through that a little bit? Yeah, I think the the general hope in in some in some situations is like, man, we want these auditors who are generally, you know, can be somewhat untechnical, um, to come in and really, um, you know, point out problems because I can use that to say like, look, like we need to, we need change, and then everyone kind of has to agree, right? It's like that compliance hammer, and you know, generally generally regulations are built to say like you have a regular scanning schedule and you're regularly doing something with these vulnerabilities. And we technically were meeting those requirements, right? Like that's, that's what we were. We had a schedule and we were doing things that we, we were actively pursuing the vulnerabilities that were coming out of the tool. And it's really up to us to make that shift, to make it better. Mm -hmm. um, because we're the ones that technically understand it. And I think that's really where it came down to was I knew it was failing. And I was, I was pretty much, you know, like I think what a lot of people do, you know, they wanted to kind of like shift the blame to something else instead of themselves. And I was like, you know what, this was, this is definitely my failure here. Um, let's, uh, let's just fix the problem. And that, that's what we did. I was, yes. I was trying to look for a scapegoat. So, um, would you say that you were trying to trying to get the auditors or you were hoping that the auditors would go, this tool is insufficient or this? Um, exactly. Yeah. So I think this happens a lot. Um, I'm, I'm guilty of this at some point where you're like, okay, this is not working. I know that this thing doesn't work, but I'm having a hard time justifying changing the tooling or spend or whatever it is. I'm hoping that the auditor can come in and go, uh, this doesn't work. You should, you should change the tool. And then I can run around with my audit stick and I can be like, well, audit said, and I can, you know, I can use the uh, hammer of auditing to go <laughs> and influence the organization and change stuff. And that's just not what auditors do, right? They, they're there to go, is this process in place? Is it, are you following the process? Is it documented? All that good stuff. Now to some point they're like, are you, fixing how the process, you know, the outcome of the process, they could care less about the tooling. Yeah. Uh, it's all about the process and is it working? So I think that's a thing that, that happens a lot. Um, and, and we sort of get s s a little bit stuck in. Um, so I, I, I agree with you on this, this whole, like, um, I'm here, I'm hoping that someone can help me influence some change. Uh, but it's just, maybe not, not working the kind of way that I want it to work. So, um, 
now that we've talked about um, this maturity model a little bit, Lake, and you've seen it a couple of times, mm -hmm. uh, we'll break the fourth wall here, right? Like I've showed this <laughs> to you a lot. Yeah. Where Where did you think you wanted to go when you started this new process of like, let's redo this so it works better? Yeah, I definitely wanted to be in that first bullet of AppSec and Dev co-own application security. All right, there's a lot of nuances to AppSec. There's different frameworks coming out. Like there's another new JavaScript com framework coming out every day, right? So, you know, and they they're like the they're the experts of their own realm. I you know I can generally support what they're doing and understand you know the the general security practices that need to happen. But to actually help implement those security practices in every single little framework that a developer could use. Um, is very difficult for just people who aren't developing to do, right? So I really needed their buy-in to help manage some of this. Because if we're going to use like very innovative solutions, you know, <clears throat> like going switching towards a more single page application approach, uh, that was definitely what we were going to have to do. Does that well, make sense? Yeah, totally. I, you know, You've got new technology, if I can summarize. You've got new yeah. technology in the organization. You need new technology. You need to assess some new technology to support how that is being built uh, in a better fashion. We're going to talk about process and people as well. Uh, but I think first we get to talk about the fun stuff, and that's tool selection. Yeah, tool selection. This is the fun part. Oh, wait. We had a... We had a uh, we had a poll going on. So we we were asking people, where do you think your org is on the maturity model? Um, kind of split in between desire to mon monitor, modernize, desire to modernize uh, and commitment to shift left. And then we've got, you know, it's basically a bell curve right there. You turn that on its side and there it is, bell curve. Bell curve uh, yeah. So that's, that's really good. Um, I love that people are not just all in one, um, and I also love that people are still here attending, trying to learn some tips and tricks from somebody who's done it. <laughs> All right. Tell them about the stuff. Yeah, for sure. So this is kind of like a high level approach to, you know, how we kind of selected our SAST and infrastructure as code vendor. Um, so it's kind of like if you were to go back to that other slide where it showed like what we're looking for, all that's really going to be right here. Um, just prioritize um, from an importance. Um, so, <clears throat> can you uh, can you um, highlight for the people that are that are watching some of the things that you think are really important on the journey from two to three to four that are listed in here? Right. So some of it's technical, some of it's um, how you want to integrate, some of it's you know it just has to do. Um, but some of the things that are in there that are critical to help you get two, three, four. Yeah, for sure. Um, for us to get to from one to two, uh, we definitely needed a SAS scanner to be able to scan our Micronaut, the Micronaut framework for Java. And that's um, number one, like a have to have. For, for me to be able to shift left, I need to actually have SAS scan results from a scanner to actually, you know, to say that we're improving our code, something's not wrong, you know? Sure. So that was like, obviously that was like number one, like that had to be the first criteria for any SAS scanner. It has to be able to scan the framework that we're using, right? Um, <clears throat> so that was number one. Um, so, and then I would say from there, we really needed unlimited scanning applications and environments for us to get shifted all the way over to that three and four and a simultaneous scan. So those three of those three buckets right there, I would say were the next the next step into shifting from two to three. You know, I need to be able to scan when I want, what I want, no matter what environment, and be able to scan at the same time. I should be able to have like two scans going on at the same time, right? So that, that those were the next key indicators to me about what I needed to choose going from two, you know, two to three. <clears throat> um, yeah. So, um, I think the, I think you're talking about has to be able to test the things that I have. Yeah. Has to be able to do that fast. Yep. Um, and then has to be able to support multiple where's and when's, right? Like yep. 
got to do it fast. Got to do it where and when I want it. And it's got to do my things. Yeah. Fair Summarize. Enough. Yeah. You, you summarize it a lot better than I hey, did. I well, say. you know, that's what I'm here. I'm just out <laughs> here listening to what you're saying and turning it into other words. Um, I got Michael made a comment in the Q and a here or in the chat. Uh, he just heard Roger Grimes of no before say or organizations aren't demanding secure coding skills. So universities are not teaching it. Hence the greater need for ship left AppSec tools. And while I agree with that in principle, <laughs> I also think that it's, um, it's a weird dichotomy of saying developers should be security professionals when we also don't say security professionals should be developers. So the shift left need, I always liken more to like how accounting and finance work. And you tell me, you work at a credit union, you tell me if this rings true to you. To you. The, um, when, the, when the finance and accounting team need, infor, need to deliver information to executive team, right? They want to say, hey, if we increase our membership fee, what does that do to our top line and bottom line? The finance team doesn't go, well, let me teach you about the GL and how the GL works and how accounting works and debits and credits. They go, here's a tool that you can use to make those decisions, right? They're the experts in their field and they're going, here's tooling that can help you make your decisions. And I think that's that's really the crux of the shift left movement is helping security teams provide tooling to developers so that they can make smart, informed, fast decisions. Um, so yes, there is always a lack of training. College is only four years. You know what I mean? Like you can only teach people so much stuff in college. Um, and then in and that they, four years, right? Like it, it probably changed by the time you graduated. That's right. Exactly. <laughs> so, so I don't think we're ever going to get to the spot where a developer, an engineering graduate comes out of, out of college with a bachelor's degree, um, and goes, I'm a security expert. Like even security experts don't do that. They don't come out of college with a BS in um, computer security as experts in security. They come out with general base knowledge on how to go function in their role. In their role. So anyway, all of that to say, I think that the shift left thing is all about like helping people uh, understand in the context that they're working to be able to make decisions faster. If you disagree with me, put it in the chat. I'd love to hear that. If you agree, then... We can all thumbs up and have a great day. Uh, anything else you want to talk about on this particular slide about your SAST and IAC vendors? Uh, not not really. I mean, it, it's pretty straightforward. The next slide is going to be very similar. Cool. Um, so, well, let's talk about my favorite one then. Yeah. Right. And then our DAS vendor, we uh, <clears throat> we obviously went uh, with Stackhawk, um, and because you know you guys met you know all my main criteria, right? I have unlimited scanning unlimited applications and with those applications you know i can scan in any environment i don't got to pay extra because i want to scan in dev and in test and in production um it it's just it, it, it is what it is i can use it however i want um i can put it on all my developers laptops without it being licensed i can put it on securities you know if you're doing red teaming teaming capabilities i can put it on the red teaming laptop um I can use it how I want to use it. And so that was a big selling point for me. And then the, obviously the great CICD integration and the quick scan times. So I think most of our scams fin finish under two minutes. Most of the time it's under a minute, but you know, that, that, that doesn't slow development timelines, right? Like that two minutes, like, you know, <laughs> that, that's like watching an ad on YouTube, right? Yeah, there you go. <laughs> yes if you watch ads on youtube that yeah. is what it is like <laughs> awesome um any any of these things that were critical to the to the shift as well like on the same thing as the last slide any of these things maybe two or three of them that are like this has to work or i'm not getting out of two or this has to work or i'm not getting out of one yeah so for sure like the last one the unlimited scanning applications and environment and simultaneous scanning, those three combined, I wasn't getting out of two. Um, and then to get out of three, to go into four, you know, I needed, I needed e easily digestible remediations and I need things connected to like CWEs and OWAPs 
a, a lost top 10. So I can like tie that into my GRC process later on down the road. Cool. Um, so those are the, the top things I noticed. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Well, let's talk about how you uh, put them all together then. I think we're going right. to talk about uh, what we have affectionately dubbed the easy part. Uh, yeah. I, I always think technology is the easy part and also the fun part of what we do in security. Um, but this is a little bit about how Lake stitched all this stuff together, how it's all working. So show them, show them what you did. Yeah, for sure. So, I, you know, I, I love, I love the credit, but you know, I, I wouldn't have been able to do this without my DevOps team. Uh, they're, they're the ones that really implemented this. So like I said, in the beginning, um, if I didn't have them, a good relationship with my DevOps team, obviously I can't implement any tool well into the CICD pipeline. So this is what we're doing with Sneak and Sonar Cube. So, you know, we have our Azure repos, we have our Jenkins environment, and, <clears throat> you know, we send them to the scanner every time a, a, a pull request happens, anytime a build happens, we are instantly taking that and we are... <clears throat> Putting it, um, putting it through the sonar cube scanner or the sneak scanner for SCA, um, and all of that gets put back to the user in a nice format for them to digest uh, on their pull request. So anything went wrong, it's going to give them a link to exactly why their pull request passed or failed um, at a high level. Um, so, but yeah, like I said, I I didn't implement this. You know, my DevOps team implemented it. Did we come, did we collaborate together? Absolutely. Um, 100%. But I can't, I can't take all the credit for it. I wish I could because right. it's really cool. Yeah. So <laughs> um, maybe talk a little bit about why you're doing Sneak and Sonar Cube. I, uh, I don't think we've talked about Sonar Cube yet. Yeah. We talked a little bit about Sneak uh, and we've talked about Micronaut and um, some other things, but I don't think we've talked about why Sneak and Sonar Cube. Yeah, the reason we went with Sneak and Sonar Cube is because um, Sneak wasn't able to, you know, kind of dive into those syncs and sanitizers of the Micronaut framework, and Sonar Cube doesn't do SCA, and <clears throat> so it doesn't do open source scanning. So, like, if I'm using a, you know, a Django REST framework and there's vulnerabilities for five dot five dot one, you know, can we upgrade to five dot two? things like that. So just making sure that, you know, the things we're using inside of our tools are, are safe and secure. Yeah. Um, and so Sonar Cube doesn't do that. It's just a, it's just a SAS scanner. So we had to have both to really paint that static code analysis, like with, with a green check mark. Okay. Here's, here's a good question. Cause I, I, I feel the same way about what I know about Sonar Cube and isn't Sonar Cube more of a quality tool? I know I've seen Sonar Cube kick out stuff like this is unmaintainable, or uh, I can't remember what the actual word is. Something like that that says uh, it's written poorly, so it's uh, going to yeah. be a pain in the ass to maintain. Um, but talk a little bit about how you're using Sonar Cube, uh, if you had to do any customization stuff to it, uh, and maybe what a, a little bit of just what you're using it for. Yeah, so it does both. So it's great. It's great for developers. So it's going to like for like Python, it's going to read in like the peep. I believe it's like peep 008 gives it like the formatting rules. Pep 808? Pep 808, yeah. <laughs> All right. All right. Sorry, can you guys hear me again? Yes. What happened? I, I, I pulled on my, uh, my strap too hard here. Oh, okay. <laughs> my headphones, yeah. I don't have All right, a, cool. Anyway, sorry. Um, so yeah, so like the the peep, the peep uh, 008, um, it outlines like formatting, formatting uh, for guidelines for Python. So like, uh, it'll just like make you adhere to those. So to be a more, um, you know, this is how you should maintain Java code. This is how you should maintain JavaScript. This is how you should maintain Python. It does do all that, which is great for our developers to have a single place to say, this is how we format our code. Um, and we let them decide how we're going to do that. So if we wanted to do something custom, they they could do something custom and cool. um, how they want to format their code. Uh, it also does do SAS scanning. Um, it also does do SAS scanning. Um, okay. uh, you know, it's going to check for definitely the, you know, a lost top 10. And, you know, does it, 
do as well as a, you know, sneak that knows what framework it's using. So like if we were, you know, let's just say we use Django. I'm, I'm a Python guy, so all my references are going to be a flip sure. part. So let's say we're using Django or the Django REST framework, right? We're <clears throat> And it know it obviously knows how to read the, read those sanitizers of how the APIs are going to be pulling in, so it knows how to read the framework. Obviously, you're going to get you know less um, false positives from a from, from a tool like that. So we do run into some false positives with our Sonar Cube implementation just because of that. Okay. Um, it just directly leads it reads what's there. So there are pros and cons to you know trying to be you know we're going to use any the, the coolest, the new innovation of the new JavaScript framework or Java framework. It comes with some cost because, you know, the, the market right now is definitely taken up a lot in that aspect by your, um, your spring, your Ruby on Rails and your, your Django REST framework stuff. So obviously that's what a lot of companies are going to cater to from a business perspective. It's completely understandable. Yeah. Cool. All right. Um, I just looked at the time. We have like 10 minutes left. So we're going to go wow. ripping go through fast. some of this. I want to yeah. make sure we get to the relationship building stuff. Yeah. Um, we're going to talk. There's a really good question in here. Maybe we can hit it at the end about how you prioritize against all of these different tools. Um, but just some of the things that, <clears throat> sorry, like I'm going to drive some of these slides for you're you. Good. Some, of, some of the things that Lake has built, and obviously you're going to get some of the, this, get these slides afterwards. So you can take a look at how, kind of how we built uh, some of these gates and how they're worked into Azure DevOps uh, and how they work. So that's the Sonar PR decoration. Uh, here's the Stack Hawk implementation, which looks very similar to a lot of our documentation. So uh, if you're interested in how that works, um, that's going to be in the webinar deck as well. Um, we will get to how do you prioritize, um, how do you prioritize amongst all of these tools. Uh, in just a second, but I want to make sure that we get to the the hard part of the webinar and what oh, hopefully everyone's here for how to how to help build some of these relationships across the organization. Sure, yeah. So this you know goes back into influencing leadership. Um, <clears throat> so like kind of like what I said at the beginning, you know, we identified that you know our EAP digital and DevOps team were paramount to our success. If I didn't have all of those three teams on board well you know we were gonna not do well no matter what tool we had right so we had to heavily involve all of those teams meetings demos proofs of concepts anything around appsec i needed their leaders and their engineers involved so we could have an active you know collaborative um <clears throat> environment and another big component of that is being open to criticism. You know, a lot of times, kind of like what I said in the, in the beginning, my ego kind of had to take a little bit of a deflate. Um, I couldn't be the, the center of attention. I think that's what a lot of people sometimes struggle with is they want to have this tight, tight grip on, I'm the app set guy, right? And I just realized that, you know, I, I just can't do it all myself and, and that's okay. Um, Make sure you're, we're actively listening to what their problems are. Because like I said in the beginning, it's going to come full circle. And now their problem is your problem. Because, I don't know, for instance, let's just use a random example. If, you know, <clears throat> we didn't dash scan or didn't provide enough time to bring in a third-party penetration test, like, that's, that's on me because we didn't plan it. And if I'm not involved in their development cycles, you know, that problem, which is their problem to inform me of, but if they don't, right, it's still my problem at the end of the time because we released code that wasn't scanned, right? Yeah, cool. <clears throat> so, you know, making sure, making sure that we are definitely um, active listening was the pinnacle to how all of this got, got there. And, you know, free pizzas, free sandwiches, all that helps too, because you can always listen better when you're, when you have a full stomach. <laughs> tacos and pizza hey, your ears work better when you're starting i know right growling. i see what you're saying uh i think we have a poll question here about what do you think the biggest blocker um in your organization or the attendees uh what do you think the biggest nope that's the wrong poll i guess we don't have a poll question for this one uh this we'll leave this poll up 
Uh, but this is where, oh, wait, sorry. Here we go. Technical issues behind the scene. What's the biggest blocker um, to your goal in AppSec? Uh, is the poll. So go ahead and answer some of that. Um, talk to talk to us about some of those, how, how you were influencing these teams. Uh, if anyone was like, no, I don't want to do this. Like I'm out uh, unless I have six pack of tacos. <laughs> yeah. Um, from what I remember, um, there wasn't a lot of like, no, I'm not going to straight out do this. It was more, um, we want to do this, but I just don't have the time. I have these 10 projects I have to get done. I don't have time to, to help you implement this. I think that was the biggest, the biggest problem is I'm already, I'm already working my people, you know, my people to the grave over here. Like, how can I, how can I help influence them to, you know, get this done too? Um, <clears throat> and the biggest selling point was that, you know, from there is like, you know how, like, I've been coming to you, like at the end of the track here, you're like getting ready to push. And I'm like, Hey, but you have this sheet of problems and all that like slows you down even more in your development cycles. You know, we don't have to keep doing this, right? Like this problem we have, like it, it can go away because we can start implementing that into our development cycle to begin with. Mm. Um, so that was probably the biggest selling point was, you know, this stoppage We're like, Oh, this can't go live because we haven't, we haven't done any scans. We, we didn't even know this was going on. All that stops because, I know that it's going on now because I see the scans coming through. I, I can see what you guys are, what, what you guys are actively working on through, mm, awesome. through my lens of the world. Yeah. That's awesome. So, so I, I, I would say that was the, probably our key to the success was saying I could solve that problem for you. I know you guys are, are worked, but we can probably, we can, we can make it easier in the long run. Awesome. Uh, we're going to keep going here. I, I know some people might have to leave at the top of the hour. If you do, thank you for coming and joining us. You'll get the whole recording when we're all done. If you can hang in there with us, we got some really good stuff just in the next couple slides. Uh, Lake has done a really good job here. Um, Richard, you looks like you raised your hand. If you have a question, please put it into the chat or into the Q and a we'll love to try to get to it. Um, so some of the business outcomes, like we, we've been talking about um, business outcomes of, what this turned into, right? You changed how the organization is doing application security to try to get a little tighter. And we want to talk about business outcomes um, just to see what that turns into. Uh, go ahead talk about it a little bit. Yeah. So, you know, I don't, I don't have, you know, this is all still f fairly new. Um, so a lot of this, like, you know, we were kind of talking about this earlier, um, but I don't have like super, you know, in-depth, you know, KPIs right now to, to present, but uh, a lot of the business outcomes is definitely, you know, process wise, we are more involved in development than ever before. Mm. Um, so, you know, that should lead our members to have more trust in what we're doing, more trust into, you know, our developers and their skills um, because, you know, we can, we can show that all of their code is being scanned and things are getting fixed actively um, like right now. So uh, we're not, we're, we're trying to do the best by our members. And I think that should definitely, you know, instill trust to our members. Um, yeah. Awesome. I think so right before our webinar today, we were talking about this slide and um, what we have kind of on the slide here is just, is more process than it is business outcome. And I was asking Blake, or sorry, Blake, uh, Lake a little bit about what business outcomes, what like what things are driving. And he, as he just mentioned, uh, doesn't have a lot of tightly tied KPIs quite yet. And one of the things I challenged him to was figure out what the executive team is talking about as KPIs and how to tie your AppSec program to those KPIs. Uh, so instead of trying to, trying to convince them that they should care about a security KPI, integrate yourself into the KPIs that they're, uh, that they're talking about already. And Lake's eyes went, Ooh, 
Yeah, so. <laughs> that's a interesting okay. idea. Yeah, right. I I don't know why I've never thought of that. <laughs> so, but yeah, I, from that perspective, I don't have a lot. Um, but you know, we are going to be actively getting those now. <laughs> yeah, awesome. All right, so uh, we had that poll up that was about what are the biggest blockers to your goals on the maturity model. Uh, over half of the people said getting buy-in from other people in their organization. Um, tons of, tons of really good information in this webinar about that. Finding right, right technology is again, sort of the low, uh, low piece on this, like, cause it's, the, it's the, the, it's sort of the easy part, right? It's sort of easy. If you understand the process that the people are using to build software, it's sort of easy to go find the technology that will work there. Um, and then understanding and redefining processes, the next uh, number two there. Uh, Grace, thank you for joining. Uh, and if you would like to come talk about success in your org, I would love to do that as well. Uh, Grace said she wanted to see success story from uh, like a really, really big organization. Uh, I would love for someone from a really big organization to come talk to us <laughs> about the same thing. Uh, I know we have some, but they're kind of reluctant to talk sometimes. So uh, if you are in a really big organization and have transformed just like Lake did, uh, we'd love to talk to you as well. Uh, let's see. So where do you think you are now in your AppSec journey? Obviously the AppSec maturity model is not designed to go one to four because one to four is really actually a lot of work and will probably take a long time. But where do you think you are today on the maturity model yeah, I've, we're definitely in three. We are we are definitely committed to that shift left approach. Um, we're definitely not in four yet, um, and, and that's definitely okay. It's it's been a long journey, um, but we still have definitely got more to go. Uh, we're probably on between that second and third bullet. Mm -hmm. um, we definitely our GRC process we're revamping, which def which is going to directly integrate with all of this. And that's going to definitely push it up a notch. So we're using automation to, um, you know, really get, you know, important vulnerabilities like, you know, but like the red signals, you know, police sirens on, hey, this needs to get fixed like now, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we, don't, we don't have a lot of that right now. Um, and that's really, we, we had some of, some of it's in place. I'm going to say we don't have a lot of it. Some of it's in place, um, but we're revamping it to make it better so that, everyone has visibility and not just us, you know, we're going to have open communication lines and a lot more, just a lot more process um, that's driven by automation rather than people looking at it. There's always going to have to be people looking at vulnerabilities, mm -hmm. but the things we can get through like a triage through automation, eliminating the noise is really what I'm talking about. Gotcha. So to answer the question that was asked earlier about how do you prioritize amongst all of these tools? Yeah. Uh, well, I think what you're saying is there's work to be done there still. There's work to be done there. I've done it before at other organizations. Um, really good with correlating data, pulling things down from APIs um, and putting it all in one place. So where you can just get a, a nice picture of like, okay, this application has these SaaS vulnerabilities, these DAS vulnerabilities, and these SCA vulnerabilities. Looking at that, how do I triage to fix certain things? Like mm -hmm. some of them might be, some of them might be correlated together. Like, oh, this doesn't work if this is fixed, right? This DAS, this this DAS vulnerability won't work if I fix this SCA vulnerability. Well, there's there's my triage. That's where I need to focus, right? Because if I just eliminate the problem with the package upgrade, then I don't need to fix code. I don't need to change code. I can fix it with a package upgrade, right? Mm -hmm. So it's things like that kind of like layering things over and having a more fixated view. Yeah. I, mean, I know you're decorating PRs for a lot of stuff. Are your devs currently working on triaging any of these, any of these findings? Uh, not, not right now. Uh, when I said that they're not triaging, I'm doing more of the triaging. Okay. Uh, they're definitely fixing the vulnerabilities that we kind of have a, um, <clears throat> a general policy where we, we automatically fix things that are, high critical or urgent we use a five scale so basically okay. a three or four or five they automatically have to fix and then we talk about the ones and twos so, so that's, that's kind of what we're doing right now 
Yeah. yeah. Um, when I say, so, when I say triage, I mean, looking at the finding and then fixing the uh, particular finding, yeah. not, is it a positive or a false positive or whatever? What yeah, I mean the, is actually yeah. fixing because the, the holy grail of AppSec is fixing stuff. <laughs> right. um, so yeah, so you do have uh, developers consuming that information in CICD and fixing based on that. So that that helps with your prioritization, right? You've kind of set a working agreement with the dev teams that say anything over this, we're going to agree that you should fix it. If you run into a problem, come talk to me. I uh, would love to help you with that, that kind of stuff. Um, but that helps with that. How do you prioritize things in all these tools? Because you've got, now you've got 50 people trying to do fixes instead of one people trying to prioritize right? what I should be working on, right? Yeah, it just increases the power of the organization. Yeah, cool. Awesome. Uh, let's see. What's next? Yeah, like what are we defending, right? So... You know, what's 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 the point of what's the point of all of this you know we have you know every line of code every interface every piece of functionality a server like infrastructure wise like all of that is like kind of what we're defending our member data financial data intellectual property a reputation loss like our our brand is the core to why people want to bank with us so if they mm -hmm. lose trust with us then you know that's that's like a integral part of our business like we're we're in people's most in like some of the most um <clears throat> like yeah, intricate parts of their lives that they're trusting us with and you know you have to really take that into heart whenever you're defending all of this um and building out processes to make your code secure um because if we have trust erosion right like you know we we lose business because because of that we don't gain new business because of that. You know, we have mm -hmm. people like Patrick Mahomes and Travis Kelsey, um, you know, voicing how great we are. So like all, it, it doesn't just affect us. It affects all of our business partners as well. That financial loss, that trust erosion is huge in this space. Yeah. Curious if you have any of uh, Tay Tay's money deposited at your bank. <laughs> I, I couldn't say even if we did. There, there, okay. there, that's, that's the right answer. <laughs> Um, all right. So I love the way that you frame this up, right? This is the same thing we were just kind of talking about, like, how do I align with business goals? I almost guarantee you that this is some of the things that the executive team are talking about and measuring in some form or fashion. Uh, and if you can align your AppSec program in a similar form, it's much easier to talk about and get buy into. If you can say, Hey, I want to help, uh, reduce the time it takes to acquire new Community of America credit union customers, because we have this statement about what we do, um, about how we protect your assets, the trust that we can build either through the website and process, process and policy and all that good stuff. Um, I guarantee you they're talking about that. So that's, that's really awesome stuff to move from those tactical goals of like how many highs and mediums and how old are they and, and things that we typically like to cling to as security professionals to really tying to business goals um, and really helping the executives understand how that security team is fostering those goals and not just turning into like, you, you made a mention right before we started about insurance departments. Like how do you, <laughs> how do you measure the effectiveness of an insurance department without yeah. having it um, without having a tornado come through your town, yeah, uh, right. which is what has happened recently or a hurricane or whatever. And, it, that same problem kind of happens in security if you're not trying to feed those same kind of business goals. So awesome stuff. Uh, let's see what else do we got here. Yeah, so this is just kind of forging what we're doing in the future. I kind of mentioned some of this before. Um, proving our GRC program. Uh, we're increasing our red team abilities, especially with our awesome partnership with Trust Foundry. They're definitely, you know, helping us push us in the right direction. Um, and then we're doing, you know, security policy by code, which is our proactive security gates. You know, what can we put in place to not allow things to move forward? Awesome. Um, hey, there was a, a good check in or a good uh, question in here about OWASP de dependency check. It is such a mouthful. OWASP dependency, dependency. check. If you tried that um, in the Jenkins plugin instead of sneak SCA. 
Uh, I have not. Um, that's something we should definitely look into, though. That seems interesting. I, I, I have not. Cool. Hey, good question. You just, yeah, that's a good question. I, you I just know. let Blake know. Or like, <laughs> why do I keep saying Blake? I, people say it all the time, and I, I, it's, I, it's, I, I answer to anything that rhymes. Look, I know your name is Blake. <laughs> I was just like, it's for some reason it's coming out of my mouth. Uh, all right, cool. So we've got some of the investments you were talking about investing in GRC. Um, some of the things that you want to do to be able to streamline any of that, anything that's really, really important that you want to call out here um, that you think is really critical to kind of moving along. I just, I just kind of want to point out is that, you know, automation reduces the noise that you can feel. So if you have ways to automate something that can, um, you know, reduce some like the, the scope of which someone manually has to look at, it's, it's going to greatly improve your process. And that's really what the goal of this whole slide is talking about. Yeah. Awesome. <clears throat> yeah. That avoiding that manual handoff is it's, it's super important, right? Like yeah. avoiding, avoiding the lake has to round up the vulnerabilities and then figure out who to hand them off to uh, through automation and through really tight integration, super important to like make the whole process really smooth and fast. Thanks. Okay. By security clock. security gates like kind of yeah. part of your grc program is security gates you have some of them implemented already i don't know if they're yeah. uh hard gates or soft gates are they you've you've already had agreement that like medium and above or or high and above are getting fixed or should be fixed yep. are those hard gates today do you want them to be hard gates we want them to be hard gates they're not like super hard gates yet um we're converting a little less than half right now to hard gates. That's our plan. Um, we actually have, I think, a meeting next week to really dig in and show what that's going to look like to our leaders and our leadership. Um, the goal isn't to like slow things down because that's instantly what people think, right? Like, oh, we're going to slow mm -hmm. down. And we're not, it's not what we're trying to do. It's trying to say like, let's fix it now so we don't have to fix it before you go live is really, really the issue. Because what's, what's, what's going to be more disruptive is do we fix it now or do we fix it when you already got a new development project in the pipeline and you need to get this finished? Mm -hmm. To me, the latter is way more disruptive than it is in the beginning. And so that's have you. Where, sorry. No, it's okay. Um, I'm curious if you have gotten to the point where you're getting incremental findings instead of, because one of the things that happens in, in, people don't often know this, right? Is in typical AppSec land, you, you run a test and you've got a giant list and you're, and you're like in this perpetual, like the list is giant and here you go, the list is giant and the, and the list is giant. And when you kind of get into this more uh, continuous security, automated security, the list gets really small and sometimes doesn't do anything. Like there's nothing on the list sometimes. Yeah. Have you guys gotten to that point where you're getting uh, PR decorations that are like, all good, keep going. Yeah, that, we actually do have some right now with a lot of our microservices. Our EIP team is fantastic. Um, they're, they're fixing things as they go. And you know, that's, what, that's, what, that's who we want to convert into those hard gates because over, over half of our microservices have zero problems. There's nothing coming back. There's, there's nothing there that says, hey, this is great stuff. Like yeah. that, those those are the ones we're targeting, right? Because they're actively, it, they're actively participating in how, you know, how this methodology should should work. Because they were, we're rotating in the vulnerabilities, and if something gets caught, then hey, it's time to fix it, and then the list goes away. Like yeah. at that point, right? Like if you get it down to where like there's just one or ones and twosy things, something big happens, you're not spending. You're like, oh, which big thing do I have to fix now, right? Mm -hmm. You're, you just added on to my list of 200 things to do. Right. Now then it's just, like, oh, I have one thing. Then it just turns into a similar thing as like a linting error. Like you, yeah, the right? tab is wrong here or this package needs updating. Okay, cool. Exactly. That's great. All right, let's do a little recap. I know we're 12 minutes over. Thanks. Most, like almost everybody hung on, hung in there with us. So I yeah. really, really appreciate that. Uh, we lost a couple of people, but that's okay. Um, but thanks to everyone who's st stuck in there. Uh, let's talk about some of the key learnings. Well, the things that you learned uh, that are super important that some of the people can take away here. For sure. 
Yeah, so the main thing I learned is, you know, before you go out and buy tools, make sure you really understand what your organization is doing, how they use and how, how they use their current development tools and how they currently develop because that's key into making any successful program work. If you don't understand how your developers develop, you know, what their processes are, then how, how can you actually help them? You really can't, right? You got to understand what their problems are because you should aim to fix those problems. Um, really identify who those pivotal leaders are in your organization. So if you know, you know, <clears throat> my platforms team has over 50% of my code, obviously there's a, they're going to be a huge partner to you. Your DevOps team, the people who are running your pipeline are going to be a huge partner for you. So you need to make sure you cultivate those relationships very pristine. Um, yeah, so um, I think... I I added a little spoiler or a little um, spoiler into here about the tacos uh, on line two there. I, don't know if <laughs> I did. Yeah. <laughs> okay, great. Buy some tacos. tacos. Everyone loves yeah. tacos. If you don't love tacos, right. buying some pizza, whatever. Yeah. Uh, remember full bellies here better. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> you, can always, you can always learn better on a full stomach. That's right. I, I think this is super good information. And I think, um, some, some things that I've seen happen in other organizations, you know, Lake's organization developer wise is, is relatively small. It's, it's kind of a small moldable, meldable, you can know everybody kind of an organization, uh, which is cool. And it gets, as your organization grows, it gets harder, mm -hmm. but always remember you can start with a small team, right? You don't have to rolling out big bang security solutions is really, really hard. Um, especially when you don't understand how people are working and in AppSec specifically, it's very hard. So if you're in a bigger organization and you're struggling with how am I going to do this across the whole organization, I would, uh, give you some advice to start small, just like Lake did here, start yeah. with a couple of teams or a team, understand how they're doing process, talk to the DevOps team. You're going to find a lot of similarities across, uh, some of the tooling and tool sets that they're using understand more of their process. The processes will change a little bit between teams, but not hugely. So spend some time with a couple of teams or a team or two teams, try some things and then iterate, right? Use yeah. the, use the agile process to implement your new security, your application security program, the same way the agile process is serving the developers. If you use agile process to develop your AppSec program, it will serve developers as well take feedback. You got to listen. You got to listen to people go, this sucks. It's okay. It's not a personal shot at you. They just want it to work in a different way. And then listen to how they would prefer it to work. Exactly. That is, that was the biggest key that I, I definitely want to emphasize. Start with one team. We definitely started with our EIP team when we were implementing, and then we rolled it out to the other teams. So we, we picked the, we picked the big game hunter. We picked the team that had them, that had the, uh, a lot of, and they already had a lot of code and was already actively doing a lot of these things. And we specifically targeted them because, you know, if I target them, you know, a solution that I build for them is going to be pretty much 90% there for most other teams. Yeah. So I would awesome. say you're, you're spot on there. Great. Well, it's, uh, we're 16 minutes officially over time. So thanks everyone again for hanging out. If you have any questions that you haven't asked, um, if you haven't asked and you would like to ask Lake about his experience or some of the tips and tricks that he might have uh, to help you along your journey, please dump them in the chat. Please dump them in the Q and a um, in the meantime, I really appreciate everyone, everyone hanging out, talking to us. I really appreciate Lake your time uh, walking us through this, working on this presentation, giving it to, uh, you know, walking through all the things that you did taking, taking ego shots to yourself, uh, <laughs> about like, I, I did not do a good job here. So we worked on, uh, making it better. Sure. All, all in, all in service of the organization, right? Everybody, everybody works at the same place. We're all working towards the same goal. Uh, being that, being that champion, um, for devs, but also for security in an organization is challenging, but is super rewarding when it starts working. Uh, questions. I don't see any questions. 
Alexa, do we have any cleanup uh, housekeeping items? Um, just, I think the the next slide we hot off the press. Oh, hot off the press! Look hot at off the press. Oh, jeez, <laughs> my bad. We have just launched our shift left maturity model ebook, so it goes a little um, deeper into the maturity model that we talked about today highlights um, overcoming challenges, a lot of what Lake shared, and then highlights a couple uh, stories of companies that have successfully moved from the various stages. So you can click on or snapshot that uh, QR code, um, and then we will send a follow-up with uh, the recording slides and then a link to get the ebook also. So you'll have it in your email in the next day or two. Yeah. As per our internal Zoom meeting, you cannot click on the Zoom. <laughs> uh, we had a Zoom meeting the other day that had a link. People were trying to click on the link in the Zoom. That doesn't work. Uh, but yes, the QR code will work. Um, also, you'll get this in the recording later. Um, so if you don't have time to bust out your phone and QR code, um, you'll have a time later. Anything else? Um, I just am so grateful for you, Lake, for sharing your story, Scott, for being the commentator. Um, it's been such an engaging webinar presentation. Um, the audience, thank you for sticking out through the, the course of the presentation and just being so active and present. We really appreciate you all. Thank you guys for having me, man. I feel honored to be here. <laughs> it's awesome. You did, you did a great job, Lake. Um, Thanks again, Alexa, for kicking us off and, and cleaning it up and reminding me that there's another slide. Uh, <laughs> thanks uh, again, Lake, for all the information that you provided here. Thanks for all of our attendees for uh, coming and joining us to talk about what's happening at Community America uh, and all the awesome teams that are participating in their AppSec program there, as well as hanging in with us. Uh, you got great content. It goes a little long. No big deal. <laughs> All right. All right. Uh, I don't see any questions, so we will uh, shut her down. And thanks for joining us and join us again next time when we talk something similar or equally as exciting. <laughs> Bye. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.